Test. Um, so today um, we'll continue learn um, the momentum um, and we'll talk a little bit about if we have time we'll talk a little bit about what actually is happening um, in practice that is uh, um, the uh, when we have this uh, non-convex problem uh, what happens in practice all right so um, first, let's look at the formula. And the intuition is, okay, right here. So let me move this a little bit down. Um, this is a formula. Um, the idea is, so like, like I said earlier, uh, I know some of us are not gonna, you know, um, for example, pursue uh, this optimization um, later in our career, but the, the importance is idea. The idea is how do we remedy um, the step problem? So. Um, we've learned, for example, if we learned for 49 last semester, we know that the convergence, like we analyzed earlier last uh, class, that is the convergence is highly sensitive to the learning rate or step size. If we choose the step size too big, we're gonna get in like this. If we are choosing step size too small, you know, it's it perhaps takes millions of iterations to reach the minimum. Um, to introduce a momentum, the idea is if our, um, for example, without uh, um, the momentum, this is nothing but the gradient from previous step. So the idea is simple. If two, in con two consecutive steps we have gradient in the same direction, it means we are heading in the right direction. If um, you know the gradient changes direction, we use previous steps gradient to correct it. This is the idea of momentum. Um, I mean, it 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 has uh, it has various uh, it has various forms, and uh, we we learn the simplest form. And in the homework, we'll see uh, in this guy, this uh, Nesterov, Yuri Nesterov, this uh, Soviet guy, uh, the original paper, what he proposed. So um, so let's back to the one um, D analysis. I mean, this example, so by the way, a lambda is a number. So lambda uh, is a number that's greater than zero, right? So this is lambda greater than zero. And we know that the X star, which is a, a minimum, local minimum for this function is zero. And we wanna analyze this. So we first write, we write down the uh, gradient descent so if we write on the gradient descent, it's nothing but alpha f prime of xk. So this is nothing but xk subtract alpha lambda xk. Okay. And then we add this momentum term. So we have xk plus one equals xk minus alpha lambda xk and then plus beta uh, xk subtract uh, xk minus one. Um, I mean, if uh, if if xk um, if this term is like uh, we we if we don't have this xk minus one, for example, we're in the first iteration, 
and uh, we don't have it, what happens is uh, uh, we can apply. So so we can apply it from the second iteration. That's very simple. I mean, in the um, in the PyTorch official implementation of this momentum, it's using the same idea. It's called using a buffer. So um, in so we'll learn how do we use a buffer to store the momentum. Essentially is we store previous gradient like on computer using a buffer and this buffer will pass to the next like uh, um, iterations. In that we don't have to store XK, I'm sorry, we don't have to store this whole thing, okay? So we only have to store this uh, difference. So in the buffer and then we pass it because uh, um, like uh, implementation wisely, store this is bad. <laughs> uh, involving, you know, it messes up the uh, auto grad computation, uh, especially um, with that. So we don't want to store, we only store the value of this without the gradient. So that's an implementation trick. Okay. And now let's see, uh, we want to analyze. Basically, we, anal we rewrite this uh, in a single form that is. Uh, one minus a lambda plus beta xk subtract beta of x k minus one. Okay. So the trick is if we assume so a priorily, um, like we said earlier, so if we have this answers, that is. Uh, That is, if we know that xk plus one, that is a plus, um, the answer is xk converges to uh, x, this uh, um, star. What happens is uh, um, if it converges to linearly, um, if it converges to the linearly, then it is some, um, then it's something like uh, so it's like uh, some rate of convergence, something like this. Okay, so overall, we will get something like uh, so rho to the kth power x zero. And uh, um, I think K plus one. If we have this answers, okay. What we want to do is we rewrite this XK as some sort of a factor times another thing. Um, so this is a, the trick. So the trick to apply is to let xk equals uh, beta to the k divided by uh, two to the power uh, zk, okay. So instead of analyzing, instead of analyzing the rate of convergence for x, we analyze the rate of convergence for z, okay. And what happens is if we plug it, this in, so we plug this in here, we'll get uh, X, sorry, we'll get beta K plus one divided by two, ZK uh, plus one, this is the left, okay. So this one was XK plus one. And then this equals one minus alpha lambda plus beta, uh, beta k to the k divided by two to the power uh, zk subtract beta times beta k um, minus one times x 
C. Sorry. This is ZK minus one. Okay. This is uh, XK minus one. We essentially will replace this trick with our original um, rate of convergence equation. And uh, uh, what happens is uh, um, if we make this substitution, uh, we can simplify it better because uh, we have um, the terms, for example, this term will match this term. So we divide this term uh, to the right and what happens will be, so we have this ZK plus one equals one minus alpha lambda plus beta divided by square root of beta, ZK subtract ZK minus one. Okay. Now what happens is uh, um, once we get this recurrence relation, uh, we let u equals this guy. And then this implies, this is our recurrence relation. Okay. So, I mean, if if we Google uh, this Chebyshev polynomial, like we uh, we said earlier, um, we will immediately realize this recurrence relation stands for orthogonal polynomial, which is of Chebyshev. Okay, and now what happens is uh, um, so. We try something like this. So if we let uh, z of one, I'm sorry, z of zero is one, z of one is u, then we can use this recurrence relation to infer every single z in the sequence. For example, if we let z uh, zero equals one, z one equals u, uh, we just plug in uh, z0 here, z1 here. So it's like 1k equals 1. We'll have z2 equals 2u uh, times z1, which is u, subtract uh, z0. So we have this 2u square minus 1. Okay. If we plot the, um, if we plot it something like uh, something like this, um, that is, uh, so let's plot. For example, this is, uh, so we restrict ourselves uh, u, so this is u axis, and this is our z axis. We restrict ourselves so that uh, u uh, is from uh, minus one to one. So minus one to one. And what happens is, uh, for example, let's, let me use another color. For example, this is, this is Z zero, okay. And Z one is U, so Z one is like this. Okay, so Z one. And Z two is more interesting. Z two is two U square minus one. So two U square is something like, uh, something like this, okay? However, uh, once we minus a one, it's like a two U squared was originally like, like this, right? But we minus one is like when U is one, two U squared is two. So uh, it will be like this, okay? So this is Z two. And the minimum value of z two is actually uh, is uh, is actually minus one. Okay. And then k two, we have z three is two uh, u times z two, right? Which is two u square minus one. The minus uh, z one, which is u. Okay. Um, I mean, we, we can we can do this on and on. So, uh, but uh, eventually, so for example, let's compute it. This is four u 
cube uh, for u cube minus 2u minus u, then minus uh, 3u, okay? If we evaluate this, this is a cubic polynomial. So the cubic polynomial look something like that, okay? Uh, but so, but at the boundary point, if we look at this, when, when u is one, this polynomial is one, okay? When u is minus one, this is a minus four minus three times minus one, which is plus three. So this polynomial looks like this. Let me use another color, maybe this, okay. U, sorry, Z3. And the most interesting about Chebyshev polynomial is it never escape the interval one to minus one if we restrict our interval of consideration uh, from like uh, from this U. So um, this recurrence relation, okay. Implies ZK form, so K equals zero to infinity form the sequence of Chebyshev polynomial. in variable u, all right. What happens is for Chebyshev polynomial, we have a special property, uh, even though uh, we won't go into detail about uh, Chebyshev polynomial or in general orthogonal polynomial, uh, we only need to memorize this. That is for Chebyshev polynomial. This implies if u is between zero, I'm sorry, if u is between minus one and one or absolute value between uh, one and one, zk, okay, zk of u is between minus one and one for any k, okay? So we have this important, uh, like, uh, um, property. So what happens is uh, we can just use the expression. So, uh, and we let basically zk equals zk of u. So zk of u, so that it's a, a Chebyshev polynomial uh, in U, in variable U, then what happens is back to this, um, back to our, this ansatz, okay. That is we assume um, X of K, because we have this linear convergence, so we assume it bears certain form. So for example, um, we just plug that in back in this form. So put uh, and back to uh, X K equals uh, beta K divided by two Z K, okay. And now what happens is uh, we have this uh, um, X of K, um, beta. Equals beta K divided by two. So ZK is now, um, what happens is just, where was it? Right here, okay. So for example, in our uh, in the derivation here, we let z z zero uh, is one. Okay, 
But in general, Z0, so let me add a line here. In, in derivation above, we let Z0 uh, equals one, but from, from xk equals beta k divided by two to the power uh, zk, this implies uh, x0 is the same as z0. Basically, we, we replace k by zero, we have z0 is x0. And this actually implies uh, when we use this recurrence relation, okay, uh, we actually, we have an ex extra factor of Z zero. So this is a beta K divided by two to the power times Z zero times uh, this uh, ZK of uh, U, this polynomial, okay. Polynomial in U. And now it's because uh, um, Z zero is the same thing as X zero. So eventually we have this formula that is XK is beta k divided by two, x zero. And zk of uh, u is just uh, zk of this guy, okay? Now we just gotta use the special property of Chebyshev polynomial. That is if the input, if the input is between um, zero and one, then what happens is, uh, I'm sorry, if the input is between minus one and one, so if the absolute value of uh, this is between uh, zero and one, uh, then we can safely guarantee that the absolute, so we take absolute value, like we can just get rid of this term, okay? So, so if, we let one plus beta minus alpha uh, lambda two divided by two square root of beta, absolute value less than or equal to one, then absolute value of, after we plug it in ZK, okay? So this is by property of uh, Chebyshev polynomial. Then this will be less than, absolute value will be less than or equal to one. Now, if we take absolute value on both side, what we will have is uh, this implies absolute value of xk will be less than or equal to beta k divided by two to the power and uh, x zero absolute value. This is exactly first order convergence, okay? So, um, I mean, it, it's less than or equal, so it means it, it might have a better uh, convergence than a linear rate of convergence, but we, we still have this linear rate of convergence. So this is, this is pretty much like, a, um, so for example, from here, for example, right here, our, um, our this row to the kth power. So if we rewrite it using uh, k, then it's like, uh, then it's like xk equals rho to the kth power x zero. Then that formula we have just uh, derived right here. Um, this row rate of convergence is like square root of, of beta, okay? So what happens here is, uh, um, Basically, we have to, just to require this less than or equal to one. Then we have the convergence. The reason is because uh, uh, because x star is zero, so we have this x k minus x star. This is the same thing as x zero minus x star. This is the same thing as convergence now, because if we require uh, beta is between zero and one which we did require beta is our momentum constant we required between zero and one, then we have the linear convergence. And now the question is, how do we choose? So the question is, um, 
the question is just uh, uh, how to choose. Um, beta such that this is less than or equal to one. Okay. So this is our next question. So because in previously, if we just assume, okay, if we assume this is less than or equal to one, then we can achieve our goal. And now the question is, uh, uh, how do we choose beta? The answer is we can estimate beta. So for example, if we have estimate this lambda, all right. Um, so for example, in this example, okay, we have lambda being a fixed number, okay. So in this example, in this analysis, in this analysis, uh, lambda is assumed to be fixed. But in general, imagine, but in general, just imagine uh, we have a, a general quadratic function, it's like a uh, lambda one times x one square plus lambda two x two square divided by two. Essentially, we have a multi, uh, like dimensional quadratic function, and then. Um, but in general, we we can assume lambda is in. So in general, we assume lambda is between lambda minimum and lambda maximum. Right. Um, and then it's so it's essentially um, because we want this guy be um, between minus one and one, and we we know an estimate of the lambda. Lambda is essentially our um, the eigen. I'm sorry the eigenvalue of uh, the maximum eigenvalue and the minimum eigenvalue of the Hessian matrix. And what happens is we just let uh, this lambda, we have a bound on this lambda. Lambda is between lambda max and lambda minimum. Um, then, and this function right here is like a decreasing function, decreasing linear function with respect to lambda. So what we have only to do is we just have to set minus one equals one plus beta minus alpha lambda minimum divided by square root of beta. Uh, and uh, one equals one plus beta uh, minus alpha times lambda max, okay? So what happens here is uh, then we just have to um, solve for like a beta. For example, we will have beta. So uh, for example, if we plus these, these two equations, we'll get a beta in terms of, uh, in terms of this uh, alpha. So for example, so uh, if we add them together, we'll get uh, the left side is zero and we have this two plus two beta subtract alpha lambda minimum plus lambda maximum divided by square root of beta. Um, and then we just solve for lambda. I'm sorry, we're sol solving for the step size first. So we'll get this alpha is gonna be two plus two beta divided by lambda minimum plus lambda maximum. So let me move this a little bit here. So in general, we should make this assumption. And uh, um, and what will then, so we have this alpha 
being right here, what we can do is we subtract this uh, from this, we'll get, uh, we also get the following. That is two equals, so we subtract two equations, we can get rid of beta and we'll have, this is uh, uh, minus alpha lambda maximum. So we use this, uh, oh, um, because it's a decreasing function. So this is my bad. I made it reverse. This should be the maximum and this should be the minimum, my bad. Okay, because, uh, because alpha is a positive number. So uh, this function is a decreasing function of, uh, with respect to lambda. And what we have is actually minus alpha lambda min plus alpha lambda max divided by square root of beta. Okay. Uh, two square root of beta. Okay. Um, sorry, two square root of beta. Okay. So what we have here is, um, so now we plug in this alpha back here. What we'll get is uh, alpha times lambda max, subtract lambda minimum, divide by two square root of beta uh, equals, and we plug in this result here. We'll have this is two plus two beta divided by lambda minimum plus lambda maximum times lambda maximum subtract lambda minimum divided by two uh, square root of beta equals two. Okay. So this is, uh, this is this equation and this equals two. And now this is a quadratic equation about, about square root of beta, if we think about it. So this implies, if we simplify it, it becomes, we have a beta, okay? Uh, for example, uh, we, can, we can cancel like two uh, right here. So then we will get an equation about a quadratic equation about square root of beta. So we'll have something like this. All right. So now we have solved um, the beta. Um, now we just have to apply um, like, uh, for example, we just have to apply um, the quadratic formula. So we solve, so we solve for uh, square root of beta. So we solve for uh, square root of beta. We, we just initiate the quadratic formula. If we initiate the quadratic formula, and by the way, um, lambda max subtract to lambda min and the lambda divided by lambda max plus lambda min. This is nothing but uh, the rate of convergence. This is the rate of convergence of gradient descent. Okay. So this is rate of convergence, convergence for gradient descent. We can rewrite it using condition number. It's kappa minus one divided by kappa plus one. Okay. So now we use the quadratic formula for square root of beta. Uh, we, we only have to keep like the one that's less than one. Okay, so we keep the root, we keep the smaller root. We will have two roots, but uh, we keep the smaller one. 
And if we keep the smaller one, what we have is going to be, uh, so it's going to be this kappa minus one. So we just plug in the quadratic formula in this equation, treating this two times this uh, kappa minus one divided by kappa plus one as coefficient. And then we'll have this two, uh, this guy and subtract square root of, uh, so subtract, so two times this guy subtract square root of kappa minus one, kappa plus one square. So this is kappa, this is not K. So I realize my handwriting may sometimes be uh, confusing. Uh, this is kappa square minus. So we have two, so this is four and minus four. Okay, and then divide by two. And we'll see that we'll have a factor um, like factored out. So what happens is, uh, for example, what we will have is going to be just kappa minus one divided by kappa plus one subtract. So we expand the square root together. We'll have this is kappa uh, plus two kappa plus one, and this is kappa minus one square minus one. So we kind of factor out a, a two factor. And what happens is uh, we'll just have, this is uh, kappa minus two kappa plus one minus, um, Um, what I'm getting wrong. Oh, we will get a minus then zero solution. So um, this is beta times this guy. So two beta. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad. This is plus. This is minus. Okay. So this is plus, this is minus, and uh, this is plus, this is minus. And uh, this is plus, this is minus, okay? So, so here we're gonna have minus, and this is plus, subtract kappa minus two kappa plus one, okay? So we simplify it even more. We will have uh, kappa plus one divided by kappa minus one this term subtract this term we're gonna get four kappa uh so it's gonna be four kappa taking square root we're gonna get two square root of kappa and uh the denominator is just gonna be kappa minus one and what happens is uh we'll have this is kappa minus one and kappa minus two square root of kappa plus one And what's interesting is the top is gonna to be square root of kappa minus one square, but the bottom we're gonna rewrite it using square root of kappa plus one, square root of kappa minus one. And eventually we'll get, uh, this is kappa square root plus one divides this kappa square root minus one. This is our square root of beta. Okay, so we, ha we, we have a long, uh, we have a long derivation of uh, square root of beta, but if we look at the expression here, okay, the expression here. So back to absolute value of that less k less than or equal to beta raised to the k divided by its second power. And this is x, absolute value of x zero. 
Um, so this is this is almost the same thing as saying x uh, k plus one is approximately equal to beta one half uh, x k. Okay. So beta square root is our our rate of convergence. So this is the rate of convergence. All right. Um, what happens is why? So we want to compare this rate of convergence to the original rate of convergence. Um, Uh, so, so this actually implies, so that is a momentum. So gradient descent with momentum. So gradient descent with momentum has a rate of convergence, uh, this. And the question is, is it faster? So it is, it is faster. So versus the gradient descent kappa uh, minus one and uh, kappa uh, plus one. Okay. Why it's faster? For example, if our kappa, uh, if our condition number, if our condition number is say, um, let's assume so example. So if our kappa, the condition number, which is lambda max divided by lambda min is 100. All right. So the original rate of convergence uh, is about, uh, for example, uh, is about this uh, 99 divided by uh, 101, all right. So basically like every iteration, the error, so the error, so this means, uh, so GD's rate of convergence. Is this, it's like every time the error reduced by one a hundredth. Basically, uh, it's like uh, every time uh, we are one hundredth closer to uh, the minimum. But momentum, okay, its so rate is what is nine divided by eleven. All right. How, how much faster it is, it, it's about 10 times faster, okay. So that's why its acceleration is so significant, even though it's still linear, it, it, it is still linear rate of convergence, but because uh, of, uh, you know, so for example, this every time we're well, like moving 100th of, total error, but this reduces like one tenth of the error each like uh, iteration. So it's acceleration is so significant and moreover, so so let's, uh, so in the last few minutes, I wanna say the advantage is, uh, in our analysis, we assume this lambda is between lambda min and lambda max, which is essentially where, um, we're doing analysis for convex function. Okay, so for convex function. Or say the Hessian, you know, the Hessian is positive. So we'll say the Hessian is uh, positive than uh, lambda min that's greater than zero, okay. Uh, actually, this is already strongly convex, but uh, let's just uh, say it's strongly convex. So advantage of a convex function, um, the rate of convergence, 
to the right. Keep this in mind. In the analysis, we have kind of eliminated alpha. So the rate of convergence is actually independent. The rate of convergence is independent with the step size. That, that's the most significant advantage of the momentum. That is, it is not, okay, so it is not dependent on alpha anymore, okay. So that, that's, uh, this is the most significant advantage of introducing this extra momentum correction. Intuitively, we just, you know, correct our gradient by previous step, but, but after, you know, uh, introducing this, uh, so this is the first advantage. The second advantage is, uh, so from the analysis, because of this lambda min and lambda max, we introduced this, okay. Uh, even though our analysis is 1D, but this actually generalized to multi-D, that is uh, for multi-dimensional problem. The rate of convergence is the same in all direction. It, so we will not encounter that, uh, for example, this ellipse, if we apply GD, we'll go here, we'll go here, we'll go here, we'll go here. So if we apply momentum, we'll, we'll be likely go something like that. Okay. So for multi-dimension, the rate of convergence uh, is the same in all direction. And let's use that ellipt uh, it, like an elliptical problem as an example, okay. So intuitively why it's good. Okay, so let's say if we have this, uh, our, the contour or say the level curve of our, um, this function is this ellipse and uh, the condition number is kind of huge because uh, uh, it, so the gradient is very big uh, along this direction, but the gradient is kind of small along this direction. So if the first step were like here, okay, originally, so this is our gradient direction. Originally in the second iteration, we're gonna go here, right? But we corrected we correct it using this gradient. So what happens is the second step originally should, you know, bounce this way, okay? Like bounce this way, okay? So this is, uh, let me add. Okay, so this is, uh, this is uncorrected, the gradient. But once we correct this gradient by the first gradient, it's like adding this to that. So it kind of cancels with the tendency of going up. And then we go this way, okay? So this is the corrected gradient. All right. So it's kind of cool. I mean, this is a very simple trick. And uh, literally it takes no more like uh, computational resources. Okay. So it's just one more addition and that's it. So it's kind of amazing. So that, that's it for today. And uh, uh, on Monday, uh, we'll continue to learn this topic but we'll learn even more advanced algorithms. Okay. So I'll stop recording.